My name is Patrick J. McGinnis, and I coined the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out, and it's why some people end up following the crowd. But we're not like them. We're part of a new species that isn't afraid to do things differently. I call us FOMO sapiens. And this is the show where you'll meet people like us, phenomenal FOMO sapiens, to learn how they find the courage and the ideas to live exceptional lives. FOMO. FOMO. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of FOMO Sapiens, the show for people who don't just follow the crowd, but instead take their own path to success in business and in life. I'm your host, Patrick J. McGinnis, venture capitalist by day, author and podcaster by night, and FOMO Sapiens 24-7. And today is all about talking. Love to talk, obviously. You guys know that. But my guest is an expert in how to talk smarter. And I love that because it's one of these things. This this is a really good episode. I'm just going to say I like all my episodes. Obviously, I'm not going to put things out there that I don't like. This one is a future best of. I can see it now. It will be replayed with some frequency because it's so darn practical. It's stuff that you can use. Matt Abrahams, who's my guest, is just he's one of these guys who because he's a professor at Stanford and because he has a podcast called Think Faster, Talk Smarter. He's just used to giving people things they can use. And you will see, there's this pitching convention he introduces here that I have been using. I have used it like three times since I interviewed him, okay? So it is magical. And the other thing I love about this episode is that Matt and I, we just kind of vibe. You'll see, we we actually have become friendly after the, the episode. We've talked on the phone. We're gonna talk again. We maybe will collaborate on some stuff. He just is my kind of person. He's a good person. He's smart. He's funny. He loves words. I love words. And so it's just a winner. And I was really honored uh, as part of this. I also interviewed to be on Matt's show. So that'll be running later in the fall. But I I put Matt's out first because he has a book out. And so we got to get you guys. I got to tell you something. This one is you got to this is a real good one. You got to buy this book. And I don't just say that. I mean, you know, I, I would never put somebody on who I don't like their book. But this one's extra good. Just saying. All right. So my guest today is Matt Abrahams. He is a leading expert in communication with decades of experience as an educator, author, podcast host, and coach. As a lecturer in organizational behavior at Stanford University's Graduate School of Business, he teaches popular classes in strategic communication and effective virtual presenting. He also teaches people how to improve their presentations. And he has coached people who have done IPO roadshows as well as TED, World Economic Forum, and Nobel Prize presentations. That's amazing. His online talks garner millions of views, and he hosts the popular award-winning podcast, Think Fast, Talk Smart, the podcast. And he's the author of the new book, Think Faster, Talk Smarter, How to Speak Successfully When You're Put on the Spot. His previous book, Speaking Up Without Freaking Out, 50 Techniques for Confident and Compelling Presenting has helped thousands of people manage their anxiety to speak more confidently and authentically. Such a good topic. I love this. This is just a winner. Now, as I said, it's great. This pitching convention he brings up, it's, it's, I mean, I don't want to skip ahead to that, but that is gold. One of the best things I've ever had on this podcast. I love it. We also talk about how to speak off the top of your head, how to do small talk properly, how to make apologies, how to remove filler words, like mm, just uh, so much here. So you're going to love this show. And my small ask today is please, 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 please subscribe if you haven't already and like the show, give it the five stars or four if you're not feeling charitable today, but I would hope five. And just help me get this show in front of more people. And when you like a show, when you subscribe, when you share, it just helps the show to grow. Thank you for doing that. All right, and now onto the interview. As you know, I'd like to start every interview with the same question, and the question is this. What's a formative decision you've had to make to get to where you are today? So mine's really a meta decision. I, about 35 years ago, made a conscious choice to always lean into yes when given a, an option of things. So uh, I hadn't learned much about improvisation at the time, but I really adopted a yes and mindset. And I'll tell you, a lot of success that I've had, if, if you count, consider any of it success, has been because I have leaned in when somebody says, hey, do you, are you interested in this? Or there's an option to do this. So the, the formative decision I've made is to, to be biased towards saying yes to opportunity. So basically what you've just told me is that much like me and everybody listening to us right now, you are a FOMO sapiens. 
<laughs> <laughs> I am indeed. I love I, I love listening to your work and and being around people who think the same way. Yeah, I agree. I think saying yes is important. I I tend to do it slightly too much, but mm. uh, but it has been. I I also see the superpower of that. Now today we're going to be talking about your new book, which I have been reading. It's called Think Faster, Talk Smarter. You also have a podcast of the same name. And it's about how to speak successfully when you're put on the spot, which is something that is so important. But something it, it, when I when I got the book in the mail, I thought to myself, this is very clever because it's it's something that we all do all the time, but we don't necessarily realize what a big issue it is and, and how important it is. So it's something that we all need to master. Uh, but before we get into it, and what we're going to do today, folks, is just get into this, like get practical. I do want to know, just like frame it up for us, like, you know, because we don't, I didn't think about it. It's not something I, but, but it's kind of obvious, right? Like why, why, why is, why did, why, why is this important? So there are two, two whys. Uh, fundamentally, the most significant type of communication we do is unplanned. If you have learned or trained in communication at all, it's always been around something that is planned, scripted, you create slides, you might even practice. Yet in our personal and professional lives, we're always speaking spontaneously and no one ever takes time to really learn how to do it well. You're answering questions, you're giving feedback, you're fixing your mistakes. All of that is happening in the moment. Small talk is a big issue for many people. So the, the why is we're doing it all the time and we could all do better at it. For me personally, the why has two, two origin stories. One, my last name is Abraham, starts with A-B. I always was going first in school, <laughs> elementary through, through high school. I was a high school teacher for two years, a couple decades ago. High school teachers, elementary school teachers get lazy. They sit everybody alphabetically and they always start with the person whose last name starts with A. So for my entire life, I have been speaking spontaneously and, and I struggled with it for a long time. I worked on it and got better, I hope. The other part of why this is important is that the Stanford Graduate School of Business where I teach, many of our students freeze up when they're put under that dreaded cold call from the professor. What do you think? And these amazingly brilliant minds who know the answers, they have a response, can't get it out. So the deans of the business school said, can you help us find a way? And now today, all MBA students have the choice to take this content that I put in the book to help them be better, more successful, spontaneous speakers. So that's a, that is a compelling answer because I recall you know, I've always been, a, I've done speaking competitions and things, but I was never an extemporaneous speaker. And when I did my MBA program, before I went, I was never the guy who talked in a meeting. And by the time I left, you couldn't stop me. And probably it's too much of a good thing, but it is a, such an important skill in the business world. You, you cannot outsource this kind of stuff. Now, Matt, I do want to talk a little bit about the upsides and the downsides, because as I was reading the book, I was thinking about the gaps that people make, right? So a lot of times you get put on the spot and that's when you do things, you get canceled or you say something, you misrepresent yourself. So it's not just about being sort of as an upside generator, it's also about limiting downside. Tell a little bit about that. Well, whenever you speak, you you put yourself at risk, right? There, your status, your your position are are in jeopardy in some ways, and so that's why preparing yourself in advance. And this is the great irony of speaking spontaneously: is you can actually do a lot of preparation in advance. So we need to first adjust our mindset so that we're seeing this as an opportunity, not as a threat. That will reduce our anxiety, which also gets in the way of being effective. And then we can focus on our messaging. We have so much going on in our heads in these spontaneous speaking situations that it actually makes it more difficult for us to communicate successfully. So if we can lower the temperature and volume of the distraction we have, we can actually be more focused on our messaging which reduces the likelihood of us actually making a gaffe or saying something we don't want to. FOMO. FOMO. I hadn't thought of that. And, and, that, and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to get everybody over the hump. 
but I want to start with the biggest one of all because you kind of you you start the book with with something I think you know it is the one that that a lot of people get hung up on, which is fear, anxiety. When you're cold called, when you are put on the spot. You have a physical reaction a lot of times. Like I don't anymore because I just want to talk all the time and I love this kind of stuff. So I actually get all excited in a good way. But a lot of people, the, the fear is what drives the reaction and that paralyzes them. So let's start there. Let's start with the fear. You're cold called. How do you prepare for that moment so that you don't freeze up? Sure. So first and foremost, everybody needs to realize that anxiety in speaking, planned or spontaneous, is normal and natural. The vast majority of people, upwards of 75% of people, report feeling anxious in high stakes situations. And quite frankly, I think the other 25% are lying. I think we could get them to a nervous place too. So when it comes to managing anxiety, and I think managing is the key word, I don't think you ever overcome it, nor do you want to. Anxiety is actually helpful. It helps you focus. It gives you energy. But you want to manage it so it doesn't manage you. And you have to take a two-pronged approach. You have to manage symptoms and sources. Symptoms are what we feel and experience. Sources are what initiate and exacerbate it. So let me give you one quick example of, of how to manage both symptoms and sources. Deep breathing is by far the most useful thing you can do. A deep belly breath, like if you've ever done yoga or Tai Chi, where you really fill your lower abdomen. And what's key is the exhale. All the magic happens on the exhale. So the rule of thumb, or as I like to joke, the rule of lung is you want your exhale to be twice as long as your inhale. That takes care of your autonomic nervous system and can help reduce many of the symptoms. In terms of sources, there are many. One of the big ones is we are afraid that we will not achieve our goal. When we're speaking and communicating, we have a goal. If you're an entrepreneur, you might want to get funding. If you're a business leader, you might want to get support. If you're one of my students, you want to get a good grade. All of those are future consequences. And what makes you nervous is you're afraid you're going to have a negative future consequence. So the way to reject that is to become present oriented, be in the moment. So how do you do that? Well, you do what you and I did before we started this recording. You have a bit of chit chat. So you connect with somebody, you get present that way. Do something physical. Before this, I, I went for a run this morning. It got me centered and, and present. Uh, you can count backwards from 100 by some difficult number like 17s that causes you really to focus listen to a song or a playlist all of these get you present oriented so you're not worried about a future consequence so the bottom line is this most people are nervous you're not unusual for being nervous manage symptoms deep breathing is a great start and think about the sources and if it's because of the goal the anxiety of the future be present oriented so we talk a lot about breathing on the show, and I and I love that you went there because it is true. The more that you do these things, and talking about building up resiliency and skills, the more that you do these things, breathing, you can just go back to it pretty quickly. And so I can understand how kind of remembering that one way to respond to this stuff is to rely on your breathing and focusing on that moment can be very powerful. So all this is just highly practical stuff. What I want to do now is because I know folks listening are folks that network, are folks that pitch, are folks that negotiate. Let's talk about you. One thing you do that's really nice in the book is the, the upfront is about sort of the, the theory, but then you have situation specific advice for folks. So let's get into that. I want to start with the one that I actually laughed out loud when I saw this one, which is the small talk one, because... Small talk, you know, it gets a bad rap, but you're right. It is the, it's the icebreaker, right? And so it's something that we should learn how to do. And the great news is once you learn how to do it, you can just use the same tricks over and over again. But what advice do you have for us in terms of mastering small talk? So as in the whole book, it's really about mindset and messaging. So, so let me approach it in both ways uh, for small talk. As you said, many of us see small talk as a necessary evil. It's a challenge. It's something that we really have to do but don't like doing. 
And I, I'd like people to just think through the value that small talk has. Not only does it allow to break the ice, as you said, it allows you to find connection points. You and I, before we started this, had, had a bit of chit chat and we found at least three areas of connection that we didn't know existed. And, and some of that might lead to something in the future. So it's an opportunity to connect, to collaborate. So if you change perspective on it, it makes it a little easier and maybe something people get excited about. The other thing we have to reframe is many of us see small talk as a tennis match where I have to say something interesting and throw it across the net and then and, and maybe you'll pick it up, maybe you won't. But the, the goal is just I got to get something across the net. And I'd like people to re-envision, and, and Patrick, I don't know if you growing up did this, but I played a lot of hacky sack. I like the hacky sack analogy where the goal is to just keep the ball off the ground, right? It's not to score a point or just get it across the net. It's to collaborate with somebody. And if that's the case, then that leads into the messaging. And the messaging is get other people talking, ask questions. I am a huge fan of structure. I think one of the key ways to succeed in spontaneous speaking is to leverage structure. And that sounds weird because structure sounds antithetical to spontaneity, but in fact, structure enables spontaneity. So I have a favorite structure. It's three questions. What? So what? Now what? And you can do so many things with this if you just answer those questions. But in small talk, just asking those questions is enough. So imagine you and I are at some kind of industry conference. We don't know each other. I can come up to you and I can say, hey, uh, Patrick, uh, what, what excites you about being here? And you might share something. And I say, oh, really? Why is that so important to you? And you might answer. And then I'd say, oh, what, what are you going to do next? What are the So all I've done is ask you what, so what, and now what? And that gets us talking. So these open questions leveraging this structure can help. The last thing I'll share with you is a colleague of mine, her name is Rachel Greenwald, said something to me that I think is just the mantra of small talk. Your goal in small talk is to be interested, not interesting. And so if you focus on getting others to talk and really being inquisitive and curious, you can be incredibly successful in chit chat and small talk. And it's a great way to avoid the dreaded Oh, so what do you do for a living? Which is just, it's, 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 la it, we're, it, it's lazy. Like yeah, if, oh, if that's where you're going, nobody, nobody says like, wow, what a sparkling conversationalist after somebody asked that question. I really avoid it. Yeah. I, I used to be that guy I asked, but I, I, I totally agree with you because at the end of the day, the star of that conversation isn't you. It should be the person you're talking with. If you, in your communication in life, remember that one thing that, making somebody else feel like the star or making them the star is going to open doors, you will be tremendously advantaged. 100% agree. 100%. Well, put. well put. All right. So we've now figured out small talk. Let's talk about pitching. I mean, you're a professor at Stanford. So this is like top of mind for all your students who are pitching in Silicon Valley. Talk about how you get people to make more compelling pitches. Yeah. So first and foremost, the most important thing of any pitch, and I would argue any communication, is to really understand your audience and the people you are pitching to. It is so easy for us to just get locked into what we think is important. You really have to spend time understanding your audience and their needs. It, it, absolutely critical. Just step number one. Now, when it comes to actually structuring the pitch, I have a favorite structure for a real quick pitch. So let me introduce it to you. It is four sentence starters. All you have to do is finish these four sentences. And I believe you will have a compelling, very clear elevator pitch. So the, the sentence prompts are, what if you could, so that, for example, and that's not all. If you finish each of those, you will have a very successful pitch. Let me give you an example. As you mentioned, I have a new book coming out. It's called Think Faster, Talk Smarter. Here's how I pitch the book. What if you could feel more comfortable and confident speaking in spontaneous speaking situations so that you can come off as credible, sharp, and on point? For example, if you're doing a job interview, pitching a product, going to a convention where you have to do small talk, you can leverage these skills to be more effective. And that's not all. By mastering these techniques, you will actually set an example and be seen as a more credible and competent individual. Do you see how all I did was finish those four sentences and I have a compelling pitch? So it's what if you could, so that, 
for example, and that's not all. FOMO. FOMO. What I really like about this is the, and that's not all. I mean, all of it is good, by the way, and I'll be using that because you take those four prompts, you fill them out, and anything you want to pitch, anything you can pitch. I mean, it is pretty remarkable. It's, I love that. But I love the, and that's not all, because that is the, that's the thing to remind people about the sense of opportunity that lies in, you know, it, beyond the fields, you know, in the distance, in the horizon. So from a psychological perspective, you're not boxing yourself into a closed pitch as an open-ended pitch. Pretty, pretty magical. So how did you figure, I want to know, how did you figure that out? So this was out of necessity, actually. So one of the things that I do at Stanford is, is I, I do a lot of teaching uh, both of my MBA students, but also other executives and firms that come to, to the campus. And I was involved in a program that had 25 small companies that were there to learn how to run and grow a business. And I was coaching each company and I had 30 minutes with each company. And I was finding that it was taking forever for me to learn what the company did. We were spending half of our time with them explaining it. And I said, okay, we got to get cut to the chase. What if you could? So I just, I came up with these prompts out of necessity. And then over the years have been honing them to the point where I think they actually really, really work. I want to put it on a pillow. Great. I do because I don't want to forget that. I think this is probably uh, maybe uh, I'm not I am not pulling your chain here. I think this is one of the most valuable things we've ever said on the show. Oh wow. Thank what you. What if you could so that the third one is for example for example and then you all. do the and that's not all. Yes. Yeah. If everybody <laughs> I just want to like people should stop their cars right now if you're driving <laughs> and just ruminate on this because i'm going to use this like uh, this is so good i'm going to i'll t i'm going to credit you i'm going to credit you matt but i'm going to be you. using this for now on all right so <laughs> let's keep going because and that's not all there is more <laughs> in this interview <laughs> exactly. let's talk a little bit about the apology uh -huh. because i just heard a, a news report on like npr and there were these two women who had written a book about apologies and the reality is most apologies, especially these days, people don't actually give an apology. Oh, I'm sorry if you felt upset by what I did. That's not an apology, by the way. That is, you're putting it back on the victim of your misdeeds, right? So apologies are really important and there's just like a basic skill to being a good human being, but most people don't do them well. How do we extemporaneously figure out how to apologize when we do something because you you know you say something you do something you have, the face turns red you're freaking out you know you can you, and you don't know how to navigate but that moment is so critical what is your advice so you're exactly right with apologies one they happen in the moment and they are best delivered or the need to apologize happens instantly and you need to respond if you can as quickly as possible to really mitigate long-term consequences. And again, we have to see an apology not about us. It's about the other person and helping the other person to work through the offense that we brought upon them. So as with everything in my book, it's all about mindset and it's about messaging. And I have a structure that can be really helpful when you are uh, addressing an apology situation. And it's, I call it AAA. You told everybody to stop their cars. I hope they got back to their tri driving. But AAA, it's acknowledge, appreciate, amends. So first and foremost, you acknowledge what it is that you did that was offensive. And you take responsibility for it. So you name it. So it might be, I'm sorry that I mispronounced your name or I'm sorry that I continually interrupted you in the meeting. So you acknowledge it. You then appreciate, you appreciate publicly the impact that the offense had. So you might say, when I interrupt you, I know that I, I understand or appreciate how that might make you feel devalued or how I undercut your credibility. So you, you put yourself in the other person's perspective and acknowledge that. And then finally is amends. And in amends, you detail or explain what you'll do to change this behavior in the future. So for example, I might say, in the future, beyond not interrupting you, I'll be sure to paraphrase what you said before I add my contribution. 
So you acknowledge, you, you appreciate the consequences or impact, and then finally you express what it is you'll change, and that's amends. So acknowledge, appreciate, make amends. And that's not all. <laughs> You're not just kidding. That That is all for that one. But uh, I, I love that. And I think, you know, you talk in the book about listening, that sometimes the best talking we can do is listening. Oh, yeah. I, I guess my, and that's not all would be, I would say, and then, I, you know, listen and hear what, make sure that your message was received. Absolutely. So, so listening in all my, I've been doing this for over 25, 30 years. And I'll tell you, the most important part of communication is listening. It allows you to put yourself in the other person's perspective. In the case of spontaneous speaking, it allows you to cue into nuance because we can make mistakes. Imagine this, Patrick, we come out of a meeting and at the end of the meeting, you look at me and you say, Matt, how did that go? I immediately hear he wants feedback. So I'm going to give you feedback. And so I might say a couple of things you did well, and I might dive deep into the things you could have done better. I might say, you know, you didn't spend enough time on this. You ignored somebody's interest. And all of a sudden I'm piling on this feedback that I think is helping you so you can be better. But had I really listened, I might have noticed, hey, when Patrick said that, he didn't have the normal energy in his voice. He went out the back door, not the front door before he met up with me. Maybe had I listened better, I would have realized you weren't really asking for feedback. In that moment, you were asking for support. You wanted somebody to put their arm around you and say, hey, that went okay because you're not feeling good about it. But I totally missed that because I did not listen well. It's the three H's too. I mean, it's just this thing that I read somewhere and I've been saying to people, because I used to be the guy, I, this is a new discovery in my life. I'm the guy who always wants to solve your problems. You tell me something and I'm like trying to give you all this advice. People want one of three things. They want to be heard, hugged, or helped. Yeah. If somebody is looking for the hug and you're trying to help them, it can be very off-putting. And so looking for the nonverbal cues as well as the verbal cues and listening, mm -hmm. it is a superpower that, that a lot of us don't exercise, including myself. So I'm working on that. Now, you you hit the feedback point, which is good because I was going to ask you about that. I do want to ask you a couple more questions that are kind of like, I would say like kind of the, the tools of mastery. And one of them is vocal fillers. Um, you know, uh, Matt, uh, you know, I, um, I, um, we all have these ticks that we have, you know, everybody, even very accomplished people, you'll hear them speak and you'll be like, Boy, that's irritating. How do we, <laughs> I do these laughs after everything, which I think are really endearing, but some of you probably hate. Anyway, uh, what is the secret to getting rid of the ums and the ahs and those kind of annoying things that hold us back? Uh, well, you know, it's like, no, I'm joking. Um, it, it, what I love about you, Patrick, is you're very self-reflective and that's important because getting rid of these verbal tics, verbal graffiti takes reflection. Now, I again, for me, it's all about reframing and mindset issues first. I had on my podcast a linguist. Uh, her name is uh, Valerie Friedland. And I posed almost a, the identical question you just asked me. And she convinced me that filler words actually serve a purpose. There, there are multiple purposes, in fact. So I've changed my thinking on these. The goal is not to eliminate them. The goal is to minimize them so they are not distracting. So, so that the, having that reframe helps put it into perspective and take some of the pressure off. The filler words that bother us the most are the ones that come between our sentences and our ideas. So if I say some as I'm speaking, that's less bothersome than when I stop um, and then start again because it just sits there. You can eliminate some of those by managing breath. If you train yourself to end your sentences or phrases completely out of breath, you must inhale in order to speak again. Speaking is an exit-only event. You have to be breathing out to speak. You cannot inhale and speak at the same time. So if I train myself to land my phrases out of breath, I must inhale before I can speak again, which does two things. It eliminates filler words. It eliminates any words and builds a pause. So not only do you get the benefit of fewer fillers, you get the benefit of adding a pause, which is very helpful in communication. So how do you practice this? I challenge every one of your listeners, the next time they look at their calendar, diary, schedule, whatever you call it, speak out loud the next five things you're supposed to do on your schedule. Make sure there's more than one word. So I wouldn't just say lunch. I would say lunch with Patrick at Chez Panis. But every time I finish those phrases, 
land it, that is be out of breath, and then start the next one. And if you do that drill three or four days in a row, you will reduce your filler words almost, I can guarantee it. That's very cool. By the way, Chez Panisse sounds expensive. I hope you're paying. <laughs> it's a very fancy restaurant out here on the West Coast. So yeah, it is expensive. Okay, good. We'll, 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 we'll it's hit your it up treat, not mine. <laughs> oh, no. Um, okay. That's a good thing to practice. I mean, what I love about this is that so many of these things, again, you can practice them. They're, if you want to do this, this is your manual. It's, it's highly practical, which I always appreciate. And it's also, you know, you, it's it's something that you can apply to many parts of your life. So it, it, there's a lot of value to just learning this stuff. And what's cool, I was telling Matt before we started the interview, he has these QR codes in the book that will take you to his website, mattabrahams.com, where you can practice all this stuff and get resources. So it's very cool. Now I wanna end up on one last question. And this is one, so both of us have podcasts, you know, Think Faster, Talk Smarter, we have FOMO Sapiens. One thing that blows my mind is uh, when people write a book, they have a physiological change in their body that makes them just talk a lot longer. So they used to give a one minute answer, now they give a 43 minute answer. I have had people on my show, and I love all my guests, don't get me wrong, but I have people on my show, somebody give a 13 minute answer one time. And wow. I, actually, I actually stopped and I said to the person who I deeply love, I said like, nobody wants 13 minutes, I'm sorry. You can't do that. And then I had to actually go back and edit it and like insert me going like, well, that's interesting or asking a question or cut it out or whatever. It's, it's, it's deeply painful. Now, that being said, I just talked for, I don't know how long about the fact that people talk for too long. How do we know, <laughs> right? I mean, geez, how do we know if it's too much? Like what's an appropriate amount? How do we learn that? Because that is probably an area where I could benefit from some training. Absolutely. Concision is key, especially in this day and age. I, I believe attention is the most precious commodity we have and people blow it by just talking too much. Now, part of it in spontaneous speaking is we're discovering what we want to say as we're saying it. So we end up saying more than we need to. So we have to work on concision. My mother has this saying, by the way, that I love, and I know she didn't come up with it, but I try to live my life by it tell the time, don't build the clock. And many of us are clock builders, right? And so here's, here's how I work to be more concise. And you can be the judge, as can your listeners, if I'm concise. Before I answer a question, before I give feedback, I say to myself, the bottom line is. So I fixate on what is the critical element I'm trying to get across. And then I start from there by thinking about what's the most important things I can say to get that point across in the least amount of words. So that becomes my training. And how do you practice this? Listen to your podcast. Have all of your listeners listen into to Patrick's podcast or the previous ones. Listen into my podcast, Think Fast, Talk Smart. Pause it. Rephrase what you just heard in a really pithy, short way to train yourself to prioritize the most important thing. So you have to drill it. If you don't practice being concise, you will not be concise. I'm not going to respond in a long-winded <laughs> fashion, but I will say <laughs> that I, I agree with you. And I think it's something that uh, we should all practice. Concision is power, right? More is more is less is more. Yeah. All right. So if you like what you heard, you can get a heck lot more of it in the new book out now, Think Faster, Talk Smarter. You can also go check out Matt's wonderful podcast, which I will be a guest on. So we're going to talk about a lot of stuff over there. So if you want more of the two of our voices, you know where to find us. The <laughs> podcast is called Think Fast, Talk Smart. And if you want to check out Matt's work and learn more about him, you can go to his website, mattabrahams.com. Matt Abrahams, uh, I just loved having you here. You come back anytime. And thanks so much for being here. Patrick, thank you so much. The work you do is fascinating and, and I hope that people continue to, to use you as a, a way to learn more important things. Thank you. FOMO. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on the web at FOMOSapiens.com or PatrickMcGinnis.com, where you can get all kinds of free resources to live a more decisive and entrepreneurial life. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. 
Theme music is by Mike McGinnis and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstrom. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com. FOMO.